go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. Amen. What an opportunity we have uh, in the United States, not only to uh, uh, preach the gospel here, but to having the opportunity to preach it abroad uh, to many different nations, many different tongues. And I appreciate the opportunity to present what I believe the Lord's placed upon my heart as far as going to Germany full time. Uh, it's, it's great to be back here this evening. Last time we were in the pavilion. And uh, what, a, what a time that was. We really appreciated that and enjoyed our time there. And now we get to be here and, and appreciate Pastor allowing us to come back and try to be a blessing to you and uh, try to minister. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the congregation here. Um, many times, you know, people, we, we think of the ministry and unfortunately uh, uh, churches can take on a name and, and pastors get associated with the name of the church and so on and so forth. And we can all think of uh, pastors uh, and, and uh, whether they're, they're good pastors or bad pastors, televangelists, that type of mentality. You're not too far from Joel Osteen, right? Okay, we think of those individuals, that type of stuff. And it can even creep into Bible-believing works and so on and so forth. But the blessing that we get to see, we've been in almost about 100 churches now presenting uh, our call here to Germany. And uh, the blessing we get to see and be a part of is to see what's going on with the pews and how God uses people in the pews to get the work done. And many times, I, I liken it to the, the idea that, you know, a, a pastor many times is a match, okay? That pastor uh, is, is many times yielded under the hand of God, and God takes that pastor and starts to create some contention in his life, right? And starts to put him in the squeeze, and when that happens, and if he yields to it and doesn't break, right? If he yields to that pressure, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be a chemical reaction, and there's going to be an ignition and a spark, right? And we can have that flame and say a pastor, an individual is excited and, and follows the Lord's lead and submits to that. But you can have that flame. But what happens if there's nothing else around it to catch fire? Okay. And that's what I like about the, what I've seen and, and, and been a part of as far as across this country, visiting churches from down here in Texas all the way up to upper state, uh, upstate New York and in between, is, uh, is the testimony of the people in the pews. Okay. Uh, people, individuals that are close enough to that flame, the kindling, the dry tinder that is there, close enough to what? Catch fire and ignite as well. And that fire then spreads. And uh, what a blessing that is to see uh, the commitment. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I wasn't around a whole lot of churches before, uh, before we got on deputation. Uh, has anybody been into 100 churches within the last year and a half? Okay. And so neither was I. And, uh, but uh, I am just um, uh, overwhelmed by the commitment churches have uh, towards missions and the effort that they put into supporting missions, not just financially. Uh, many times I think it's, uh, it's, it's hard to come in and not have to deal with finances. But when we, what we experience on deputation is, is not just the financial blessings and, and people are so generous in their giving. But what we really experience is the, the connection between the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the pews being manifested in our life. And uh, so for that, we are extremely thankful. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support, not just for us, but what you do for missions all across the board. Uh, that being said, I know we probably made mention when we were at the pavilion, if you weren't there, we do have some CDs uh, that the Lord's allowed us to put together. Uh, they are free to take, uh, and, and so don't, uh, don't feel uh, bad if you take a CD. They're there, that's what they're there for. It's our little way of saying thank you. It's our little way of giving back, not just what, uh, what you uh, have done, how you've been a blessing to us, but how you've uh, uh, handled missions up to this point, and a thank you from not just us, but missionaries as a whole. And uh, so when we're getting into this video here, um, I was, uh, when we were at the pavilion, I, I about fell over. I, I asked how many people have been to Germany. I, I've never seen so many hands in all the churches that we've been into. And wow, that is a, that is a blessing. So I feel really inept here this evening because many of you have spent many more years than what I have experienced in just the few times I've been over to Germany helping an, uh, an established missionary over there already. And uh, so hopefully I don't say anything uh, in, in here this evening that is contrary to what you've experienced. Just, uh, just going by the experience that I've had and what I've seen uh, where we were at in Germany in the short little bit of time. But uh, I, I think uh, uh, when we get into this video, a short video, uh, might be a little bit different than what you've seen from other missionaries in the past. Uh, this video is going to uh, go into a little bit of the history of, of, of my wife 
and I and what the Lord had been doing through our lives and, and uh, just kind of our little niche of the world uh, that led us up to the point of, of, of going to Germany. Uh, I say that, uh, you know, Germany, uh, the, the ministry, the Lord doesn't use a cookie cutter when it comes to the ministry. And I'm 48 years of age, and you might be saying, well, why is the Lord uh, using you? Well, I don't know. We'll have to ask him one of these days, right? Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's the, any, any position in the ministry, uh, you're open. If you're kicking and breathing, uh, God can use you in any capacity, and God can call you and give you something to do for the cause of Christ. And uh, the, the key part many times is if ye be willing, okay? If you have a willing heart and a desire to do right and a desire to please the Lord, he will make that plain to you. And it just so happened to be uh, the Lord uh, opened this opportunity and, and made this available to me. So uh, that being said, I was in the elevator tra industry for over 20 years and working a secular job. And during that time, the Lord continued to work on me as an individual, allowing me to grow and, and develop what he wants inside of me. And then uh, he made it plain that he wants me to go to Germany. So I'll give you a little bit of history about us as a family. Uh, like I say, I, I don't find Germany to be that different than what we are uh, in America in the sense that uh, that uh, the America, we, we experience the rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, right? We have our education, we have our intellect, and we have our industry per se. Um, but that's, that's where I feel that Germany and America are alike. Germany is the melting pot of Western Europe. We have uh, you know, the Russians coming in, we have the Polish, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a real fluid country in that sense. So there's many avenues and opportunities to get the gospel out that will reach into far, uh, even further distant areas. But I, I, like I say, the Germany is where we're at in America, but then just ramp it up even more. Okay. And um, some people even will maybe look at, uh, I, I don't, you're not going to see slides here of, of countless people just uh, uh, gathering around asking for a gospel track. You're not going to see uh, countless children, uh, you know, in need and the humanitarian effort that you see maybe in some missionaries, which I don't have a problem with as far as supplying some humanitarian need as long as it doesn't supersede the gospel. Um, but uh, that's, not, that's not Germany. I was in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia last year for a couple weeks helping a couple other missionaries over there. And, uh, you know, I could get gospel tracts out by the stacks real quick, okay? And then they would actually read them and so on and so forth. People would reply back. Well, that's not Germany, okay? Uh, it's much like America, right? You, 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 have you ever, who's all been stifled when it comes to door-to-door -door work? Who's all been frustrated when it comes to knocking on doors or trying to just be an effectual witness on the street and so on and so forth? And you just take that where we're at in America and then just ramp that up even more because of the humanism that has overtaken Germany. Uh, the humanism putting the importance on the, the humanistic rather than the divine. And they, they worship their intellect, uh, they worship their pride, but they're also trying to uh, uh, pay, uh, pay for the sins of the past. They're trying to show how good they are as individuals to overcome what stain uh, World War II and so on and so forth has uh, placed, been placed upon them. And so they've become very humanistic in their nature and, and very cold. But uh, I want to encourage you uh, this evening, uh, real quickly, before we show this presentation, I want to encourage you, don't lose sight of the fact that there's still people there that are lost and dying and going to hell, okay? Uh, our, our, our responsibility as Christians, uh, here and abroad, is to sow the seed of the Word of God. And trust God's going to give the increase, and if the, if the numbers don't, just because people aren't getting saved doesn't mean that we're not accomplishing something by the seed that's sown. Uh, maybe God's, God's just wanting to get, what, a witness out. And if a, a person chooses to reject that witness, that seed has been, it's, 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 it's come to pass. God has allowed that to, to come to fruition. And so there's a purpose behind that as well. But uh, just to real quickly, as far as we think, uh, we don't have to go any further than the children of Israel. Bible says that, uh, he says uh, in Deuteronomy 31, 27, for I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Uh, back in Ezekiel, he talks about a nation that hath rebelled against me and uh, says they're stiff hearted. Uh, that's, that's a lot of times what Americans are like. And that's where we're at as far as trying to reach the, the people of Germany. Uh, but I do want to also say that the Lord was continually sending prophets to the children of Israel. The Lord was continually sending prophet after prophet, and finally he sent the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And the Bible says he came unto his own, and what? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well versed here. Uh, his own received him not. And, but did God stop there? 
No. Shortly after that, we know about Acts chapter 7 being one of the more pivotal parts of your, your Bible. God given the children of Israel one more time to receive their Messiah. And he sends Stephen out. And in Acts 7, 51, he says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. And so I think that uh, makes it very plain that God has not given up. Uh, he says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And by the grace of God, uh, hopefully as a, as a full-blooded German, I'm going to be stubborn enough along the right side of them and to continue to try to get the gospel to them, whether they really appreciate it or see it. Uh, we have to think of, uh, talking about having compassion on, on the lost, we've got to see, uh, look beyond what we see, right? Uh, we've got to look beyond. We, there's people out that are what? Been blinded. They've been blinded to the truth. They've been blinded uh, uh, through, through education and uh, through their own intellect, and but by the grace of God, the Lord can crack that and get through that, and, and we'll see some fruit in time. So uh, this video here is just going to be a short video. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of the particulars of Germany and then uh, our plans there. So let's go ahead and start the video. Hello, my name is Joel Bierman, and this is my wife Anne, and we are missionaries heading to Germany. We would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to present the call that I believe the Lord has placed upon my life to be a full-time missionary in Germany. We hope that you find these next few minutes of video to be informative as we present a brief history about our family, the call to Germany, some brief information about Germany, and the goals that we hope to meet once we arrive. The Lord allowed me to marry my high school sweetheart on July 24, 1993, between my first and second year of Bible school. After graduating, the Lord allowed me to enter the elevator trade, servicing and maintaining passenger and freight elevators with a vast array of technology and age. The 20 plus years in the trade has taught me a lot about problem solving and managing a territory and dealing with people on a regular basis. During this time, the Lord has blessed Anne and I with four wonderful children, Jael, Jonathan, Isaac, and Bethany. This blessing has proved to be a big help in the ministry as we tried to minister wherever the Lord put us with my wife's God-given abilities and our children's willingness to practice and participate. We were able to use music in church services, weekly nursing home ministries, special concerts, TV appearances, and to produce a few CDs with our goal to reach the lost and glorify the Lord with God honoring music. During these busy years of family and church ministries, teaching adult Sunday school, and preaching as the opportunity arose, the Lord started to deal with me about moving in a different direction. Through the wise counsel of a former pastor of mine, it was recommended that I take my vacation time and spend it helping some missionaries. In just a few short months, out of nowhere, I received a prayer letter in the mail from a missionary that I had never had correspondence with before. At the bottom of that prayer letter was a handwritten note. Hey brother, how would you like to spend a working vacation here in Germany? Well, needless to say, off to Germany we went. Since that letter, I have been to Germany seven times. My wife five, jail six, and the other children numerous times as well. These trips primarily consisted of working on an existing building for the German National Church. As with other mission fields in different locations, the establishment of a church building requires extensive labor in building and or renovating to be able to provide a sound and safe structure to meet in. During these projects, we would also try to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The last trip allowed us as a family to play a couple concerts before the preaching of the Word of God. trips that the Lord really started to deal with me about going to Germany full time.
through much prayer, fasting, and counsel, the Lord made it clear through His Word that He wanted my wife and I in Germany full time. The Lord confirmed this calling with 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. A quick study of Germany will reveal breathtaking scenery with snow-capped mountains, reflective lakes, winding rivers, and rolling countrysides to beautiful castles and picturesque towns and villages. With Germany nestled in the middle of Western Europe, its beauty isn't its only asset. Germany is also home to some of the largest companies in the world like BMW, Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, Porsche, Audi, Siemens, Bosch, Adidas, Puma, and Aldi, just to name a few. It is easy to see why Germany has the fourth largest economy in the world behind the United States, China, and Japan. Germany as a landmass is 18,000 square miles smaller than the state of California, but with a population of 82 million people, that is more than California, Florida, and New York State combined. Where Germany is weak is in its beliefs. With 34% of the population claiming to be atheist, agnostic, 30% Roman Catholic, and an ever-increasing 6% Islam, the future looks bleak. You might say, but wait, there is still 30% Protestant. Well, that 30% Protestant is nothing more than a watered-down, dead form of Roman Catholicism. With only a handful of true Bible-believing works in Germany, it is easy to see the need for the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to be put forth. Our goals are basic and straightforward. Once we arrive in Germany after deputation, we plan on working under Mark and Rose Lawrence, the veteran missionaries that we have already been helping and laboring with. Our time there will consist of learning the language and the local culture. As the Lord leads, our plan is to then start our own independent work in another town. Through street work, track distribution, door-to-door -door work, and developed relationships, we plan to sow the seeds of the Word of God. Before we close, Brother Mark Lawrence has a few words of recommendation that he would like to present. Hello, my name is Brother Mark Lawrence. I'm a pastor at Bible Believers Baptist Church. The purpose of this video is to, is to endorse Brother Joel Bierman as a missionary here in Germany. Now, I've never endorsed anybody as far as being a missionary coming to Germany. But I can say with absolute confidence, I believe Brother Joel Bierman has a burden for the German people. And I think you do well to carefully pray about it and consider him you know, as one of your missionaries here in Germany. I believe, and he has proven time and time again, by giving up his vacations year in and year out. He helped me put together this auditorium. He did the tile work in this room. He's helped with the parking lot. Every year, he'd give up his vacation to come here to work. And we wasn't, when we weren't working on the building, he was out knocking doors, and I found him to be faithful over the years, and I believe with all my heart that he has a genuine burden for the German people. I know his wife, I know his kids. I believe that he, he's raised his family in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So would you please consider him as your missionary here in Germany? I have absolute confidence in him. Thank you. Please continue to lift us up in your prayers as we try to honor the Lord through obedience to his calling in our lives. Thank you and may the Lord bless you and your efforts to reach the lost. Right. Did that put anybody to sleep? Anybody? Appreciate again the opportunity to be here and uh, try to minister and try to be a blessing to you uh, while we're here. Uh, you know, you you can look at that video and and uh, I, I look at it and I'm like, uh, you know, uh, I I fall woefully short 
of other individuals that I know, when you think of uh, great uh, uh, missionaries and, and great pastors and great church leaders and, and, and great church members, and, and I sit there and you're like, you know, why, why me, Lord? And uh, I want to encourage you here um, uh, this evening that if, if maybe you're in that boat, okay? Um, not everybody's been given the same talents. Not everybody's been given the same abilities. But the uh, Lord uh, made it plain to me a while back. He's, he's uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are uber talented, okay? But that doesn't mean they're really getting anything done for the cause of Christ. And it was impressed upon me, the widow of two mites. Did she give more than everybody else? No, she didn't, but she gave all that she had. And uh, the Lord's not interested in how much you give, it's how much you have left. And he says, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, and so on and so forth. But the reality is, is it might not look like much, uh, my life uh, in in the eyes of other people, but I can, Lord willing, by the grace of God, say to the Lord is that that I gave all that I had, okay, that I gave my life, and He's instilled the talents and the abilities in me that He wants me to have, and uh, so that's where you start getting to this. They that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Why? Because it can create some discouragement at times. Okay, uh, look to the Lord and trust Him to lead you and guide you, and and He'll get you where you need to be, and He'll get out of you what He wants out of you. And uh, so uh, keep, uh, keep keeping on here and keep plugging away and, and remaining faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, real quickly, with the sake of time that we have, uh, if you would uh, per- turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to look at something real quickly, real quickly. Um, I don't know if you noticed, Pastor came up and talked to me during the slide pre- presentation. He said, 8 o'clock. So... <laughs> Pastor, you should saw the gasp that I just saw over here. Like, oh, no, he didn't really say that, didn't he? They would quick put on their mask and to cover up and show their despair there. No. First Peter chapter 2. I want to look at something that uh, it's analogous. It's something that each and every one of us, uh, no matter where you are in your walk with Christ, no matter how long you've been saved or how short you've been saved, uh, if you're saved, this is something that is going to be applicable to you. It's something that's going to be applied to you. And hopefully it'll be a blessing, but hopefully it'll also be an encouragement, uh, not just uh, you know a, a flash in the pan, but hopefully it's something that will help you in the days and the months and the years to come. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, we uh, look there in verse 11. It says, um, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they have behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And uh, this fleshy lust there in verse 11, you'll notice that those fleshy lusts are likened unto war, right? There's a battle that is raging. There's, a, there's the uh, spiritual realm. There's the worldly realm. There's the uh, fleshy lust, and it's likened to a battle. And, and Peter's reminding us as Christians, you know what, as we go through this life, no matter where you're at in your Christian walk, there's some things that you need to be mindful of, and one of them is is this war, this battle. And I don't, uh, by by your own uh, statements and by your own reactions, I can tell this congregation is a well-versed congregation. So I think I can uh, bypass a fair amount of these references, but uh, su- suffice it to say, let's be reminded this evening that we are in a battle. Okay, uh, Paul says, he says, I have uh, fight the good fight of faith, right? Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called. You know what we're called to do, each and every one of us, is to fight. Not with each other, but we're to fight something. We're in a battle. Fight the good fight of faith. It's not a physical battle. Uh, I know many of you might be discouraged by the elections and the, the debauchery and the insanity that this country has fallen under. Uh, but you know what? That's not our battle, folks. Okay, I'm neither Republican nor Democrat or Independent. I'm Christian. Okay, and that's what God expects us of us. If you want to claim yourself to be Christian, that means you're a little Christ. Okay, and we're to walk in godliness. And so let's not let's not get entangled as we're going to find here. Second Timothy four seven, Paul says, "I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith." 
And in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, it says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I. So fight I. The apostle Paul was in a fight, and then he says, Not as one that beateth the air. It's not a wasted motion. You know, you think of, I wasn't a boxer, but, you know, you, you see the boxers and they're doing all this, sh- they call that shadow boxing, right? And I'm sitting there going, what a waste of time, right? Waste of energy. I can understand some of it for loosening up and so on and so forth. But you know how many Christians are out there shadow boxing? Like they're in the fight. But in reality, they're not even fighting, okay? They're what? They're beating the air. A lot of times it's this way, oh, Right? showing off their own goodness and showing their own abilities and so forth and, 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 and in a sense putting others down. And, uh, that's not what we're here for. We're actually engaged in an honest-to-goodness battle. We have an adversary out there that is interested in what? Seeking whom he may devour. This isn't little kid soldiers playing in the sandbox, right? We are in an honest fight and in an honest battle. We need to understand the severity of the situation. Many Christians are what we would say uh, Christian hedonists. The hedonist is someone that thinks seeking pleasure and avoiding suffering are the only components of well-being. Okay, I raised my hand to that one, right? Many times you, you go through the day and next thing you know, I'm seeking comfort and I'm seeking pleasure. Comfort and pleasure, comfort and pleasure. And, you know, if you continue to operate under that principle, you know what? You're going you're gonna to have a hard time getting out and being faithful to Christ. It's time to go out door knocking. It's time to go witnessing. It's time to come to church. Ah, I just don't feel like it, right? It's a Christian hedonism. We are in an honest, a good fight. Um, 2 Timothy 2, 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. And if we've seen it, we've seen it this week, right? The entanglements of the affairs of this life. And we're said not to be entangled with it. Um, uh, Why? That he may please him who hath chosen him to be, what? A soldier. Right? How many, how many soldiers, current and past soldiers, do we have here, uh, military? Yeah, amen. Right? You guys know what it means to be trained. You know what it means to, to keep yourself from distractions. It could cost you your life. Many, many, maybe many of you know individuals that have lost their life because of such a thing. And that is the reality in the Christian life. We are not to be entangled with these affairs. Why? Because it keeps us off center. It's, it's the, uh, it, it keeps us distracted of what we need to be focused on. So what I want to quickly go over here this evening is that very thing, this uh, fleshly lust which war against the soul, war against the soul. And I want to preach about the war within, the war within. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you. We uh, praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for the liberty that we have here in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're uh, appreciative of the liberty of those that fought for it uh, as our forefathers, uh, given us these opportunities that have made the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, I pray that we would not let our forefathers down uh, as far as a country, but uh, may we never let our forefathers down, those martyred, those that have uh, finished their course, those that have kept the faith, those that have endured hardness. Lord, I pray that we would not uh, uh, fail in this time of need, in this time of uh, severity uh, in this lost and dying world. Lord, may we uh, shine as lights, Lord, that we might be able to reach some of the lost that are uh, in this world before it's everlasting too late. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Pray that you bless this evening. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So the war within. Let's uh, take a look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, uh, this uh, sermon only has two points. It's nothing deep. It's, it's about as basic as you can get. Uh, many times we lose sight of the basics. Uh, who's all been through basic training, right? I've uh, never experienced it, but I can, I've, I've known people. I've talked to people that have gone through it. Uh, as you've uh, progressed through basic training, did you leave off the things that you did in basic training once you became a, uh, a soldier? No, you still had, right? Anybody continued to exercise and work out and, and, and maintain a certain level of basics? 
that's what we need to do as Christians. And uh, if we don't watch it, we can become what the Bible talks about, uh, heady, high-minded, right? Uh, we can become, uh, and having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. If, if we become too uh, centered upon even in, in good knowledge, uh, a false balance is abomination to the Lord. Uh, the knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. We need to watch out that we don't get too, uh, too uh, deep and then we lose sight of the basic things that are there to help us maintain a Christian walk. And so the two basic points of this message in the war within is the attack and the counterattack. The attack and the counterattack. And what we find here in Mark chapter 7, and we'll pick up there in verse 20, Mark 7, uh, 20, very basic here. Mark 7, 20, and he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, for from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. And oh, by the way, defile the man. Okay? Um... Any of those uh, on, on your tablet? Are there any of those on your ledger in your life? Evil thoughts, blasphemy, pride, deceit. The list can go on and on and on. Those are things that take place within. Many times we think that sin is the outward evidence, the, the actual act. Well, the sin many times has already taken place in the debate within the heart. When a man chooses to debate, am I going to do this or am I not going to do this? That's where the sin, when he's been enlightened, uh, he's a, an individual who has enlightenment, okay? He's, uh, he's, uh, there's something that's been presented to him, and as that is presented, the Holy Spirit hopefully will enter in and say, hey, that's dasis nisergu, that's not good for you, right? That's not very good. And so then you have a determination. You have enlightenment, and then you have the knowledge of wisdom there, and you say, hey, I should turn away. And then you start to go, well, nobody's watching. There's where the sin's at. It's the debate. When you start to debate inside, whether you commit the act or not, you've already made a determination. Well, if I can get away with it, I'll, get, I'll do it, right? And maybe somebody comes in the room, somebody comes by and keeps you from that because of the fear of man. Uh, but uh, what already took place in the heart? It's the battle that is within. And many times, uh, you know, it, it, you think, well, you know, the, the, uh, the well, we got to worry about the children. Well, no, we need to worry about the aged as well, right? Uh, look over in uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And we see this here in the Apostle Paul. And uh, this is written around 60 A.D., folks. This is some time after the Apostle Paul's conversion. Uh, it's not like he was just a babe in Christ, and we might have a little bit of patience uh, with uh, an individual uh, as they continue to grow in Christ Jesus. Uh, as ye, therefore, have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, right? Yes. And that's where we need to be. We need to be walking in Christ Jesus. And uh, we find here that the Apostle Paul has surely been walking with the Lord, but we also find that he deals with this war within, even at this stage of his Christianity, this, his walk. Uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 21 says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. That's a struggle going on, right? That's an internal struggle. And if you were to say, well, I could see that as a younger Christian. No, uh, aged Christians, okay? Seasoned Christians, beware. Uh, if you finish out that part there in Colossians, uh, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, beware. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's somebody that's seasoned, walking with the Lord, and they got comfortable all right? They've got comfortable with the situation and think, hey, I got it under control. But that's the subtlety of Satan. He's more subtle than any beast of the field. He'll take you down where you least expect it. And that's why we, the Apostle Paul is saying, oh, what is, this, what is the Apostle Paul's admission there in verse 24? Oh, wretched man that my neighbor is. 
Oh, wretched man that my wife or husband is. Oh, my children. And I could go on and on about my children. No, Paul didn't say that. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. He takes ownership of his own problems. He takes ownership of his own sin. He takes ownership of his own struggles. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Answer, I thank God. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You know, the thing that I appreciate and look forward to as far as the rapture it's not that I can get out of this world and, and escape the dangers that are here and, and coming that we know are to be true. I'm longing for the day that this flesh is no longer attached, okay? I can be separated from me, 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 me. That's where my biggest problem is. And it's here in the Christian life, it starts within. As Charles Spurgeon said, he describes this war, he describes it as a civil war. Quote, Nothing causes a man more torture than to be dragged hither and thither with contending emotions as civil war. As civil war is the worst and most cruel kind of war. So a war within. So a war within a man's soul when two great passions in him struggle for the mastery which causes a trouble and distress which none but he that feels it can understand. Christians, have you been contending? Do you feel some struggles going on? Do you feel who's trying to get on the, on the throne? Okay? You know, it's been likened then you get uh, two different dogs. You got a white dog, you got a black dog. They're totally opposite one from another. And who you give the food to is going to become stronger, right? And who you give the, the food, if the other one takes it, then he's going to become stronger. And so the same thing helps if, if, if you are feeding the, the flesh, what's going to become strong? The flesh is even going to become stronger, right? But if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill what? The lust of the flesh. And so that's where we need to feed that new man. We need to grow and, and grow in Christ Jesus. But you're not going to grow if you're not recognizing where the attack comes. Um, sake of time. Let's jump over. So hopefully, uh, I think everybody here is, is, is well aware of, of the attacks and well aware of the works of the flesh and the uh, little things that can come in. You know, the little foxes, what? Spoil the vine, right? It doesn't have to be this grand and big thing. No, it's the little things that can eat away. Oh, you know, the, the, you, know you break your key off in the, the car door, and the next thing you, you go to pull the handle, and the handle breaks off, and then the kids are screaming, ah, right? Those things just eat at you and eat at you and eat at you. And the boss is saying this and the boss is saying These are all attacks that are coming after you for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? There's principalities and powers. There's things that are going on and Satan's sending things to buy your way to what? Get you discouraged, okay? To get you to lose your temper in front of your neighbor, to get you to lose your temper in front of the, your coworkers, so on and so forth, for, to, uh, to bite and, and lash out with your tongue, and so we recognize these things, but what can we do? You know, it's easy to sit here, and if we had a, if, if we had a, um, did, did you have any demolition when you were building this? Pretty much new property, right? But if we had an existing building that was here before you built this wonderful auditorium, and pastor says, men, I got a tough job. We got this building here. It's been here for 100 years. It's, it's been put together. Who knows how thick the concrete is and so on and so forth. I tell you what, I've, I've, I've rented some bulldozers, some backhoes. I've even rented some uh, dynamite and everything like that. We need to get this building out of here. You think your pastor would have a problem if it was demolition day for the men? No, you'd have people coming in droves, uh, uh, people that even heard about it in the neighborhood. Probably would be a good way to get some people into church. Demolition day at the church, right? Blow things up. You get a bunch of people to come. Why? Because they like to destroy things and tear things down. But when it comes time to being persnickety and having some um, a keen sense of, of measurement and accuracy and detail, people start to lose sight of wanting to build things. You see, we as individuals, as Christians, we can tear people down all day. But how about we build some people up? Okay, build them up in Christ Jesus. And so that's what we want to look at here. We as individuals, we need to have a counterattack to this attack of the flesh. And so in 2 Peter, if you would, turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, these things are going to be simple, 
But again, we lose sight of the simple things, the basic things, and we're like, oh, i got to deal with this, and it's got to be something great and grand. One of the things I learned in troubleshooting elevators for over 20 years, uh, there's, there's a whole gamut of, of different equipment. There's stuff, I, I worked at stuff that was, uh, had a patent on the motor from 18, uh, 1889, uh, 1892, that was the patent that was on the motor, a three-phased brushed AC motor. And then from there, I can go and work on the latest and greatest. And there's a whole gamut in between. And there's not a textbook for everyone, okay? There's not a manual for a lot of those elevations. You think, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to fix this next call. If this one, I'm not going to be able to fix it. And you know what? As time goes on, I realized they all get fixed by the grace of God, Okay. We don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill. And then as time goes on, then I started to have them to train some other individuals that are coming into the trade. And I started to realize, you don't realize when you're going through stuff how you're actually developing skill sets that you don't even really know. And you would see somebody that was younger take a, a trouble call, and he starts to explain it. And then he says, well, I did this, and I tore this all apart. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't fix what's not broken, right? Okay. Don't make the project bigger than what it really is. Let the let let that determine how big it's going to be, and let's the same way as this. Uh, let's not let this uh, attack become too big where it consumes us and knocks us out. Let's establish a counterattack that we can be victorious in the Christian life. Second Peter chapter one and verse three. Second Peter one three. It says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. If you're saved here tonight, God has given you some things exceeding great and precious. Do you know what they are? We're going to find out. These are the counterattacks whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Oh, that is contrary to the fleshy nature. That's where Paul was talking, oh, wretched man that I am, right? He's talking about, hey, I need to start building up that divine nature. Uh, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Fleshly lust, right? How are we going to do that? And uh, we're going to uh, come down here, uh, verse 5, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Uh, if you're saved here, you've been saved by grace, through faith, right? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that's the start. That's the genesis of your walk in Christ Jesus. Did you know that God wants you to add something to your faith? How many Christians that come in and they get fire insurance and then they never do anything for the cause of Christ after that? Why? Many times, many times, you know, when that, that, that tender seed starts to come up and it's germinated and it starts to see growth, that, that little precious plant is so vulnerable to the elements, right? And that's when you hear somebody that gets saved. I usually try to throw up a quick prayer, if, if nothing else, Lord, protect that individual. Protect them in this, gen, this very uh, precarious position uh, of, 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 of threat and concern. When, when uh, a, uh, in the, uh, anything like in the safari or uh, savannah and stuff like that, you see the lions and that. A lot of those uh, uh, animals like the wildebeest and the zebras and those that give birth, you know what they're doing? They're trying to clean those newborns up as quick as they can. Why? To try to get rid of the scent. Okay? Because they're vulnerable. They couldn't stand withstand an attack. And so that's part of their counterattack is to clean up. And that is ours as well. And so what we find that we need to add to our faith here, we need to add to our faith, what? Virtue. Virtue. Virtue is strength, bravery, moral excellence. Virtue is nothing but voluntary obedience to the truth. Okay? Don't debate. If mom and dad says, hey, go and take out the trash, don't be debate and, and bicker and complain. Just do it. Have some virtue. And the same thing as we, as, as, as children of God uh, um, uh, in, 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 in Christ, uh, we need to be obedient to the Father, right? We just need to have simple obedience. We shouldn't bicker and complain with the Lord like we do. Why? Because you're opening yourself up for danger, okay? You're not allowing uh, uh, your Creator to clean you up to help you so you don't get knocked out and devoured. How do we do that? We need to add to our faith. We need to add to our faith virtue. Moving on quickly, not only do we add to our faith virtue, but to virtue knowledge. 
knowledge, possessing facts and information about a subject or situation. Like, uh, what? I have knowledge of the crime. A lot of individuals, this is where a lot of Bible believers, as we alluded to a little bit earlier, as Bible believers, we are so appreciative of the scriptures, right? And we, we love the scriptures and we want to grow and grow. But you know what can happen? We as Bible believers can be duped. Like I say, uh, many times you'll take somebody at their strength and they won't even know it. Uh, there's a form of martial arts. I don't know if it's Aikido or whatever it is. Uh, but, you know, it's not taking somebody on head on, head on, head on. Okay? It's be there. And then as the guy comes towards you, take their momentum and use it against them, right? You, you use that in wrestling. I have a, a wrestling background. And uh, you, can, you can push up against your opponent, and you're trying to feel like they're committed to you, and then that's when you can pull them down and, 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 and perform a certain move and stuff like that. We have to watch that we don't, uh, we don't become susceptible, that we're leaning so heavy on knowledge, knowledge, oh, knowledge, and yet we forget that knowledge puffeth up. We need to be mindful that not all knowledge is good is also uh, young, young, uh, young uh, 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 Christians here, uh, 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 adolescent and, and coming up of age. Um, uh, you, one of the things that is woefully absent in all the churches, majority of the churches, I don't say all, but a lot of the churches, uh, where's the young men? Very much absent. Uh, where's the young ladies? Uh, there's more young ladies than there are young men. Somebody's out there devouring them, Okay. They, uh, they uh, were just a church this morning, a, a great church, a great pastor, been pastoring that church for 24 years, and he's like, we lose so many of our young people. As soon as they get a job, they're gone. Why? Because somebody's left off contending for the faith. Somebody's not. If you're saved here and you're younger and you're still in mom and dad's house, it's your faith. It's your Christian walk. You need to be doing this now. Not when you turn 18, because at 18, it's too late, folks. You get out, if the Lord puts you into a secular college and leads you down that road of, of education, you better be sure you're sound in the faith. Why? Because there's an adversary out there. Why do you think a lot of the elections have gone the way they are? Because some people have listened too much to the professor and not to the, uh, to the creator. And that's, that's that humanistic spirit. So what do we need to do? We need to add good knowledge. Uh, knowledge, uh, Proverbs 10, 14, wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Proverbs 22, 17, bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. My knowledge. There's the distinction, folks. Not to be consumed, you know, uh, uh, with, what, with the information highway, the web, and I'm learning and all that knowledge. Knowledge should be increased. It has, right? That's where we're at. But it's knowledge, 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 knowledge. And they, everybody thinks that they know everything. But yet they don't know anything outside of the scriptures. And so watch and guard yourself. But we do need to increase in knowledge. But make sure it's God's knowledge, my knowledge. Add to that, we add to uh, virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge. We need to add temperance. Temperance is moderation. Not to uh, indulge, not to excess. We think of, I think of uh, um, the uh, temperance, and we can go to many passages, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, uh, that's what we're to be, uh, it would be temperate. Um, when you think of temperance, think of it as a, you know, as a Bible believer, he's got his sword, right? right? Sharpen any two-edged sword, I'm going to wield this sword and I'm going to cut through everything. Is that sword tempered? Okay, You can have the hardest metal in your hand and you hit this thing just right and that thing's going to... And you're going to be looking down like, oh, what happened? You were all knowledge. You had no temperance. You had no, no temperance in dealing. You didn't have any moderation to your reaction when it comes to something. Some people just want to take out the Bible and just destroy somebody again. Well, let's use it when we have to. A, a surgeon just doesn't come in and start butchering. The surgeon is peculiar and watches what he cuts and what he doesn't cut. And then he's particular how he puts it back together. And that's what we need to be. But you're not going to be that way if you don't have any temperance. God wants us to have temperance. Not only do we have temperance, we need to add to our temperance. We need to add patience. Uh, patience, having the quality of enduring evils without murmuring or fretfulness, sustaining afflictions of body or mind with fortitude, calmness, or Christian submission to the divine will. To the divine will. 
And uh, that, that is, uh, that, that's something that we're going to all have to deal with from time and eternity. You, the, the book of James, James starts out with it right away. Uh, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. That's, that's the whole temperance part added to the, to, the, uh, to the patience part. These are all connected one with another. We need to have this armament. We think of Ephesians and, and the whole armor of God. This is what we need to be doing. We need to be adding these things as our armament. Why? So we can set a good quality counterattack from the attacks of the flesh. Not only do we need to add uh, uh, patience, we need to add patience. We need to add godliness, godliness, revelation and, and belief in God and reverence for his character and laws. First Timothy uh, 6, 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, great gain. And unfortunately, there's a, 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 a world out there that wants to put the cart before the horse. Uh, they're trying to put godliness out there but they've not put salvation out there, right? And so you got people that are trying to work on these, on these things, and, and it's, that's called humanism, trying to put the importance on the humanistic rather than the divine. I'm doing these things not through my own abilities. I'm doing them through the abilities that Christ Jesus gives me. And that's the difference between religion and salvation. Salvation, somebody's trusted in the Savior and his child trying to emulate and allow that to flow through you. Man is trying to, that's what's going on in this country. They're trying to have righteousness without God. And it's not going to happen. They're trying to have peace without God, and it's not going to happen. Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And that includes us uh, as Americans. And so we need, to, we need to be adding to our faith. We need to be like God, godliness, mimicking God and his laws and, and, and loving what God loves. And, oh, by the way, you have to also be able to be, to be a good lover. You have to be a good hater, okay? It goes contrary to a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of the thought in Christianity. Oh, we're supposed to be all love. No, you're out of balance. Again, I, I'm not saying you have to be brash and difficult, but you need to have the mind of Christ, and you need to have that through the Scriptures and know what God loves. God says, the Bible says that God hateth all workers of iniquity, folks. That's still this dispensation. That's still this time period. And I'm not saying we, we, we should hate these people, but we should understand where our boundaries are. Okay, and how God looks at things and try to reach them. Quickly, we need to add to that, we need to add brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness is goodwill, that temper or disposition which delights in contributing to the happiness of others, which is exercised cheerfully in gratifying their wishes, supplying their wants, or alleviating their distresses. Um, Romans 12.10, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Do I have to say any more? It's not the me first and you next. It's you first out there and then me after if everything else gets fulfilled. You know what would happen? You know churches don't bust because of outside influence. How many churches break and, and split because there was a battle that went on within and they didn't display this counterattack and they allowed things to get out of control? Okay, We've all heard stories about churches that have split because of the color of the carpet, folks. Okay? What took place? It wasn't an outside influence. Oh, the devil's going to get us. Oh, the government's going to get us. No, how about we just work on the war with inside the churches? How about we work about the war that's going on with inside our homes? As a husband and wife, that's to, you're to be one flesh. You're to be one entity. And when one chooses to come and operate outside of that, you know what we have? We have a mess. Okay? That's why we need to contend and have the war within and have this counterattack. If we display these things and institute these things in our life, we will have a better, uh, better walk. And finally, we add to all that, we add to that charity. Charity, love that is in action, freely given, like a handout without any hope of receiving anything in return, no strings attached. And uh, praise the Lord. Uh, you know, we can talk about uh, uh, knowledge and so on and so forth, but it says there the greatest of these is charity. Okay? Charity. How about we display some charity in our lives? How about we display some charities one to another, care for one another like we ought to as what Christians should do, okay? Pray for one another. And finally, I want to leave uh, this uh, message with this here. Uh, Amy Carmichael, many of you know about her. Uh, she wrote this poem called No Scar, 
um, uh, what's the term if you are if you are in the military uh, and somebody's going to give you a lashing, the superior's going to lash. Isn't they called a dressing down? Would that be a correct term? Okay, somebody's going to give you a dress down. They're going to they're going to they're going to lay it on you, right, and and correct you. And uh, she writes this poem in the sense that the Lord's going to give somebody a dressing down uh, in in uh, what they were. You have you have pretense, and then you have substance. And many of people as Christians, we try to put forth a pretense, but if we were to melt it down, how much substance is really there compared to what we have portrayed? And uh, this is the idea of this poem, and it will be done after this. Uh, no scar, Lord speaking here. Hast thou no scar? No hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archers spent. Lean me against a tree to die and rent. By ravening beast that compassed me I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound, no scar. Yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me. But thine are whole. Can he have followed far? Who has no wound or scar? Christian, we need to be contending for the faith. Bottled up together as a nucleus, as a church. Praise the Lord for this church. This is a wonderful blessing for us to come in here and see what the Lord's doing. Don't take light of it. Okay? Pray for another one, one another. Everybody's having difficulties. Everybody's going through tribulations in life. We don't need to add to that. Build one another up and that we might be able to display a Christ-like spirit in a lost and dying world. Have some scars at the end of your life. Have something there. Have some substance when you reach the judgment seat of Christ. And everything, all your works, your whole life is put together in that cauldron and it starts to burn and burn. And what is going to be left is what your Christianity was. Have some substance. And if you follow these simple uh, rules of engagement, beware of the attack, but also set a good uh, uh, counterattack to contend. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you have truly bestowed upon us. Lord, we don't deserve these things. We don't uh, deserve the uh, blessings that you've uh, granted us, uh, whether it's uh, family, homes, uh, a church, uh, uh, you name it, the ability to uh, breathe and the ability to see. Those are all blessings from you. And Lord, I pray that we would not uh, shirk our responsibility, Lord, that we would find ourselves faithful to the cause of Christ fighting not with one another, but fighting the war that rages within. And Lord, may we be victorious for your glory and your honor. Lord, please bless this congregation in their days to come and weeks to come that they would contend for you and have the victorious Christian life. Lord, we love you and thank you and ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> I did set him up for failure tonight, and uh, which is okay, because that it's always good to, uh, for a missionary to get kind of thrown around a little bit with some things. It's, it's good for them. They have scars at the end, so you have something to preach about when he gets to the next church. But I told him, he said, what time do you all normally finish up the service? And I said, by 8. And I was thinking we started at 7. And, uh, and so then I'm sitting there thinking, you know, you're showing this, and they're saying, and boy, I, I enjoyed every bit of everything you did tonight. And But I thought, wait a minute, I told him 8, and I meant 7. So I went up and told him, I said, I told you eight, but I meant seven. But take your time, do whatever you're going to do anyway. And uh, so it worked out good. But I was at a church one time, and the pastor said, we want you to present the work. We want you to give your testimony, and we want you to preach. And then he walked up and said, you have 20 minutes to do all of that in. And I did it. Presented the, presented the work, gave my testimony, and preached a sermon. And uh, he had told me beforehand, there's no way we can take you on. But me putting all that in there in that amount of time, at the end of the service, he said, we're taking this guy on for support. And uh, so it worked out really good. Um, great sermon tonight needed for all of us, uh, the, the attack. The attack is so real, and uh, so it was good uh, to, to, uh, to hear that. We are going to do something tonight, take up an offering for him. We're just going to put the offering plate out back there in the back, and uh, I don't know if we have one of the guys. Well, Josh, can you just get a plate and put it at that back? Uh, just one of the plates off there and put it at that back chair there on the side, and, um, and what we'll do is we'll just, on our way out, if you'd like to give something to their ministry, um, then you can just put that in that plate, and that'll be for them. Everything that goes in that plate, we'll collect that, put that together, and we will give that to them. 
and uh, and use it for them. So um, let's let's uh, let's have her play and uh, give you a chance to maybe make some decisions off the sermon you heard. And when we get through, we'll close. Let's go ahead and do that. You want to come to the altar? Now be a time to do it. You can do it where your seat. You come to this altar. The altar's open. Make some decisions. Talk to the Lord tonight about some things maybe you need to deal with. It's good to see kids come, but it's good to see adults come too. And get their hearts settled about some things. There's an attack. It's real. There's a real attack. Well, thank you for being in church tonight, and uh, let's do this. Jonathan, would you come back up here real quick? Jonathan, Jonathan, paging Jonathan, come up here real quick, and uh, just come up to the front here. And uh, Brother Mickey used to do this all the time, but I, I normally, I, no, I'm not giving you, I'm giving you to something to take. So just uh, put your, it's right back there, right? Because I'll get tied up talking, but it's right back here at that back door. No, no, not plate up there. Yeah, put that up there, put that one right there with, uh, with them in that missionary plate.